Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Kalayim, Chapter 2, Halacha 8, Part 2 of the Shir and the Art Scroll. We're on 23A1. Today we're getting into the concept of Uktzin. Uktzin is going to be the last uh, Mishnah, last set of Mishnahs that we have, and it deals with food and Tuma. And that's going to be where we're talking about the Greek Gord, which is going to be finishing up what this Mishnah was talking about. All of the concepts are dealing with Uktzin. Now, the Rambam talks about Uktzin appearing as the last tractate in the Mishnah because much of, as the Rambam is saying, much of the content is derived through deductive reasoning, and it doesn't have any explicit scriptural source. Now, the Gemara in Berachot, in the Bavli in 20a, is going to describe Uksin as being a very difficult tractate. And that's also going to be why, you know, there might be just a few uh, scriptural verses that are going to refer to Tumas Ochlin, which is going to be the Tuma of food, and it's going to give very little light on the topics in the tractate. Something interesting to note is that the end of the tractate is talking about the reward for the righteous, and the end of the tractate is also talking about the very high value, the total value for peace, and for Am Yisrael to seek peace. Now, I want to read the first Mishnah, the, just so that you get it. And it says, the first Mishnah in, in Uktsin says, anything that is a Yad but not a Shomer contracts Tuma and conveys Tuma. That's going to be the topic of what we're dealing with. Now, a yad is going to be something like the vine of a grape that is attached to the cluster of grapes, or it can be like on a pear, the little stem that's still attached to the fruit. That's going to be a yad. It's going to be a handle. And the way it's going to work is that that can convey tuma, and basically that and the fruit is going to be combined as one entity, and it can attract tuma, and it can convey tuma. So it says anything that is a yad but not a shomer contracts tuma and conveys tuma. So a shomer, by the way, is going to be like the shell of a nut or the peel of an orange or something like that. And that's that's not going to be the case. But we're talking about the yad, the yad conveying it. That's going to be where you know if a source of tuma touches this yad, it can get tuma, and then it can convey the tuma to the food. Now. We're getting into the Greek gourd, and the Greek gourd is going to be special because it's going to have two ways of contracting tuma here. One is going to be with the leaves, and the other is going to be with the uksin, with the with the stems that are there. What are going to be the stems? These are going to be the vines, and these vines are going to be a little bit unusual, and uh, they're going to be able to have the ability to convey tuma and to convey it to the plant, and also even when it's attached to the ground. That's going to be a big hiddish. And so if you have the leaves, one of the other uh, issues is with ocholos. Ocholos are going to be with roofs, and the leaves are so big and significant, and they stay green the whole winter, and they don't blow away. They, they'll persist so that they're going to get the status of a roof because of the size of these Greek gourd leaves that if there's corpse tuma there, it could convey tuma uh, to anything that's under it, and also, by the way, uh, even to the plant. So all of this is going to be different than other plants and vegetables, and this is going to be uh, some of the harder topics uh, in the oral law, and so we, we're privileged to get to work on it. So the Mishnah was ruling that the plants of different species can lean over one another, and that's going to be as long as they're properly separated, and that's going to be with the exception of the Greek gourd. Now, we learned in talking about the Mishnah that the Greek gourd has another characteristic. That's going to be these tendrils, and the tendrils are going to be used to creep along the ground and to grab hold of things and to help it to grow, and to grow better. Well, if we have wheat that's going to be sort of leaning over some barley, it's not going to be attached to the to the wheat or the barley. They're not going to attach to one another. They don't have tendrils. But this Greek gourd does. And what will happen is that the tendrils will wrap around other trees or vines or uh, fences or um, other grasses and so that it can help to, to get and spread out 
so that this Greek gourd can get a lot of sunlight and a lot of um, nutrition and, and access to a lot of water. And basically, the strategy of the plant is to, is to get as wide as possible to, with these giant leaves to grab hold of a lot of sunlight. And what does that do? It, 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 uh, it impedes the growth of other things next to it so that there's more nutrition in the soil for the Greek gourd. Other species that will also have a strategy to try to limit the growth of other plants is going to be the walnut tree. The walnut tree actually inserts poison into the ground. If you ever see a walnut tree, you'll always see a dead space in a circle around the root system of the walnut tree. And that's because the, the roots submit a poison that will kill any plants or grasses so that nothing can take the nutrients of that walnut tree. Well, the strategy of the Greek gourd is to spread out. And it's going to be using these vines to get breath so that it can soak up all the sunlight and make sure there's no competing things there. Well, in the case of the Greek gourd coming over, uh, you're going to have issues when it starts to come over to other plants. And you can create calliam issues. Now, you're not going to have a calliam issue as long as you have the proper spacing between um, wheat blowing over and, and, and sort of falling over onto some barley. You're not going to have, you're not going to have a problem with that because they're not attached. But the problem with the Greek gourd is the, with the vines and the tendrils, it will make it attached. And now you, you effectively, uh, have created, uh, calliam by making this attachment with it. And also because now it's going into the other area. So, you know, wheat is not really going to grow into another area, but the Greek gourd will. So there's a lot of things going on with the Greek gourd that are not happening with other plants, and that's why we need to, part two of this year to go over it. So the Gemara is going to get into the Greek gourd and the laws on it, and they taught in a Barisa that five laws were, were stated regarding the Greek gourd. One is that we may not spread it over plants of other species. So the idea is that, you know, this is referring to the ruling of this mission, which states that the leaves and the branches of different species are generally allowed to lean over one another, but not for the Greek gourd. It's not allowed to lean over the plants of other species. And one of the reasons why that's going to be is because the leaves are going to be so big and be able to persist over the winter and stay green over the winter and stay substantial enough that it can act as an ochel and also uh, the potential for it to combine with the other plants, with the vines. Uh, part two of this brysa says that it conveys corpse tuma and interposes between uh, before corpse tuma. And the idea on that is going to be that it can convey corpse tuma. And so if you have a corpse that's located underneath this area, say under the leaves, uh, it, it, can, it can, even if it doesn't come in contact, uh, the corpse can convey tuma uh, to a utensil that's next to it under the roof. And in the case over here, that this roof would be the leaf, and the ochel or the leaf is acting as a barrier to the tuma, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to prevent it from infecting the, uh, the utensil. But over here, what it's saying is that the roof formed by the leaves of the Greek gourd is going to be such where the barais is ruling that the leaves are considered to be an ochel, with regards to Tuma, and therefore this space underneath the leaf is shared by, if it's shared by an olive's volume of a corpse and there's a utensil there, then uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be able to act as a barrier where the leaves will actually convey the corpse Tuma to the utensil. And that's not going to happen with other kinds of leaves. With other kinds of leaves, the corpse Tuma would just go up to the sky and it wouldn't be able to affect a utensil. But if you had a utensil and a piece of corpse there and the leaf of the Greek gourd, the utensil would become tame with corpse tuma. And normally where there's a corpse beneath the leaves and a utensil there, the leaves are going to prevent the tuma from reaching the utensil, but not here. Over here, you know, over there on a normal leaf, it's, it's not going to count as significant enough. And part of the issue is that normally leaves will just sort of turn brown and blow away in the winter and not be substantial, but not for these leaves. So the Mishnah in Ochelos is going to be ruling that most herbs and vegetables don't convey any form 
of barrier for tuma while they're still attached to the ground, that's going to be because most plants are not permanent enough or not substantial enough, or they will dry up in the winter, but, or, or they can, uh, as, as uh, the Rambam's talking about, that they can become blown away in the wind. But the exception is going to be the Greek gourd over there as well. The leaves are going to be green all winter, and they're not easily moved by the wind. They're not blown away by the wind. And they're substantial enough where they'll be able to convey and interpose before the tomb of a corpse. So what does that mean to, to uh, interpose before the uh, tomb of a corpse? Well, if you have the, the piece of corpse on one side of the leaf and the utensil underneath the leaf, and part of the leaf is sort of coming as a barrier touching the ground, and it's not underneath the corpse, the corpse uh, is not underneath the leaf, it will act as a barrier. That's how substantial it is. Um, why does that matter? Well, other leaves will be blown in the wind. This is not so apt to be blown and moved by the wind. Now, the third rule is going to be that in this brysa, the stems up to a tefach, tefach is going to be a hand breath, conveys tuma to and from the gourd. So if you have the stem and they cut it off to harvest this kind of giant pumpkin, now what will happen is that um, if, if this stem is going to be a tefach wide, it's going to make a yad. You have the laws of uksin. And basically, if the yad or the handle uh, of this vine, which is attached to this pumpkin, is going to get tuma, then the whole pumpkin gets tuma. Or likewise, if the, if the pumpkin gets, the Greek gourd gets the tuma, it, the yad will get it as well. The fourth case in the Barisa says that it prohibits a mixture whatever its measure. That is going to be one of the ideas about, um, about uh, nullification. Now, for Kalayim, nullification is going to be 201. For Trumos, it's 101. Here, it's 201. And we're going to get into that later, why that is, but that has to do with uh, the, the dictuk of how uh, it's derived over in the Torah, and it's put into the plural so that it's really counted as two. That's how you're getting up to 201. And normally, like if you had, um, you know, 200 kalayim onions and one, I'm sorry, and if you had 200 regular onions and one kalayim onion, um, that, would, that would be enough to nullify it. If you had 199 kalayim onions and one, I'm sorry, 200 regu 199 regular onions and one kalim onion, that would not be enough to nullify it. Again, it's 201. When you add them all together, there's 201 units, and that's going to be enough to nullify, but not with the Greek gourd. Greek gourd does not get nullified, and there's no nullification possible. Why? Because when you look at the Greek gourd, you'd say, oh, that's the Greek gourd, and it's sold by precise count, not by estimate, because it's a significant item. And because it's a significant item, and it's easy recognizable, and uh, it's not sold by estimate, it's not going to be subject to any nullification, even if it's kalayim. So that's an important law. And it says that one who vows, in the fifth part of this b'risa, one who vows to prohibit benefit from gourds without speci uh, specifying a specific type is prohibited only the benefit of the Greek gourd and, it, and may not or may derive benefit from any other type of gourd, but not the Greek gourd. So... Somebody who's say, saying about gourds without specifying a specific type is assumed to be talking about the Greek gourd because uh, it's so particular. So that's another law. And so accordingly says the Mara Fulda that somebody who utters a vow prohibiting himself from benefit from gourds is assumed just to be talking about Greek gourds but not the other ones. So the other ones are going to be allowed. Now, these two rulings are going to be dealing with a single cause uh, two of the rulings are. It's going to be dealing with the ochel, which is going to be the you know the leaves of it, and uh, it's also going to have another one with the upsin. And part of the leaning over the other things is going to be dealing with the with the vines. With, I'm sorry, with the tendrils. So there's really three things going on with the biology of the plant that gives it three different halakhic issues. One is going to be leaning over the other things and these tendrils, which are going to combine and, and grab onto these other plants. And that can create a, a kalayim issue where now it's become mixed. Then the other issue is you're going to have the ochel where it can actually convey tuma. 
And now you have the Yad, which is from Uktsin, and that can be where the stem itself, up to a tefach of this vine that gets cut off when you're harvesting it, can convey tuma to the rest of the pumpkin, the entire pumpkin, or entire Greek gourd. So the Bryce is going to uh, question the total, and Rabbi Yona says the total of the number that this Bryce says. And Rabbi Yona says, and why do we not say the laws of it conveys tuma and it interposes tuma are counted as two separate rules for the total, just to make it six? Why are we saying a different number? In other words, you know, why not just combine these into one halacha? And the Gemara is going to give another b'risa that does actually count these as uh, two separate laws instead of one. The Gemara says that Bar Kapara taught in a b'risa that uh, there were seven laws stated regarding the Greek gourd, and that one is going to be that we may not spread it over the plants of other species. The second one is going to be that it conveys corpse tuma. The third is going to be that it, interpo it interposes before corpse tuma. Four is going to be that its handle is to convey tuma, and that's going to be a tefach with a stem. The fifth is going to be that we give it um, its work area, so in other words, a single stalk of Greek gourd is going to get its work area. And that's going to be referring to a separation required just for a single stalk of the Greek gourd plant. That's even going to be alongside of the field of grain. And that's going to be that we have to leave a full bet row of a distance between the gourd and the wheat. And the term work area would seem to imply a smaller distance than the bet rova, but it's actually going to be uh, you know, like what we were talking about before, what happens when you have vegetables that are going to be planted next to uh, grain. So over there, they're going to be separating it by the bet rova. And uh, the, the derita measurement uh, for normal vegetables is going to be six tefakim, but it's going to be much larger for the Greek gourd, certainly, because it has these vines that will have the tendency to spread out. Rabbi Kanievsky says about this, that this Bryce is referring to the separation required not for a single sock, but for a row of Greek gourds that are planted alongside a grain field, which would be six tefakim. And then um, we have we have a, another issue where it says in part six that it is kalim with the Aramean gourd, and part seven is that it is kalim with the ember gourd. So these are other uh, plants like the Aramean gourd is another name for the Egyptian gourd. And the ember gourd is a type of bitter gourd that's sweetened by baking it in embers, although we're not sure exactly which kind of gourd that is today. But these gourds are climbed with the Greek gourd, and they're really going to be like standalone species. Really, they're not going to be varieties of the Greek gourd at all. So if you're planting them in a gourd area that's close to it, it's going to be kalium. So the Gemara now is going to take note of the Bryce's other missions, and the Gemara says that the Bryce did not teach that the Greek gourd prohibits a mixture of minute amounts, and it did not teach that vows regarding gourds are assumed to be referring to Greek gourds. So why is it that these two Bryce's don't match? And the Gemara says that basically both Bryce's are going to be ruling that the leaves and branches of the Greek gourd may not be allowed to lean over the plants of other species, and the Gemara wants to get into that. So Rabbi Yossi says that Rabbi Gamliel and the son of Rebbe went to the marketplace and they came and to ask him, it says the prohibition of spreading out over other plants that the rabbis mentioned was stated where the gourd touches the other plants, or does it even apply when they don't touch them? In other words, the Mishnah is saying, and I guess the shopkeepers are coming to ask, well, what happens if uh, it's going to be very close, the branches, the vines are going to be very close to the other plants. It's not actually leaning over, but it's now in the work area. It's very close. And so the mission is ruling that the Greek gourd alone of all the plants may not be allowed to lean over the plants of other species, even if it's properly separated at the planting and then it grew larger. And so it's saying that, you know, if the branches and the leaves of the Greek gourd are going to extend so far as to cover other species, that you know, that either the other species or the Greek gourd have to be uprooted. Now, those posing this question are wondering whether the prohibition is limited to a case where the gourd plant actually comes in contact with the other species or where it's just spread out 
over the other plants and it doesn't actually touch them. And so it's, in other words, it's very, very close, but it's not touching. And others are going to say that, uh, Rabbi Kanievsky is going to be saying that the Mishnah's ruling regarding the other plants are going to be provided that they are properly separated and sowing. So the Gemara is wondering whether the permit applies only where the different species do not actually come in contact, but it's permitted even where um, they do. In other words, as I'm reading Rabbi Kanievsky's comment, you know, what if they're, they're okay, maybe they're not leaning over the other plants, but and certainly they're not touching it, but they're now in this other work area. They've moved into the other work area, and now there's a distancing issue. It's not on the other plant, but it's very close. What about that? So the Gemara says that he went and asked his father, Rebbe, and Rebbe said to him, the prohibition of spreading out over the other plants that rabbis mentioned was stated only where the Greek gourd touches the other plants, but not where there's no contact between them. So even if, uh, even if they're going to be leaning over the plant, but not actually having space, or there is space, and they're not actually touching them, that's going to be okay. And even if they're moving into the other work area, that's going to be okay. The Gemara is going to give another incident. And Rabbi Yonah said that Rabbi Hillel, the son of Rabbi Valas, went to the marketplace and they came and they asked him that the prohibition of spreading out over other plants that the rabbis mentioned was it stated only where the Greek court touches the other plants or even where there is no contact. And he went and he asked his father, Rabbi Valas. Rabbi Valas said to him, the prohibition of spreading out that the rabbis mentioned was stated only where the gourd touches the other plant. So again, both are indicating that it has to touch the other plant. It's not enough to even be over it without touching the other plant and also even to go into, you know, the vines going into the other area, into the, you know, even through the work area and the separation area, it's going to be okay as long as it doesn't touch. Why are they worried about touching? Well, these tendrils will grab onto it and connect it to the other plants. And then it's going to look like it's been mixed. So the Mishnah then goes to the next part where it's talking about Rebbe extending the prohibition of the Greek gourd over to the chait melon and the Egyptian bean. Those also have tendrils as well, but in the end, he actually acquiesced to the sage's view, and he want, the Gemara wants to get into the reasoning behind Rebbe's retraction. Basically, he's just going to be leaving this as just the Greek gourd and not other plants. And the Gemara says, what is the reasoning behind Rebbe's statement of, I favor the words of the sages over my own? And the Gemara explains and says, Rabbi Hanina said, Rebbe reasoned thusly, that in the case of the Greek gourd, Egyptian gourd, which does intrusively spread out over other plants, you say it's permitted. And then in the case of the chait melon and the Egyptian bean, which is far less entangling, it is not certain that that should be permitted. In other words, Rebbe's tradition to extend the prohibition of the chait melon and the Egyptian bean, not to mention also, by the way, the Egyptian gourd, this is implying that in his tradition, it's going to agree that it's permitted to allow the branches and the leaves of the Egyptian gourd to cover other plants, to cover the uh, for other species. So Rebbe then is reasoning that if the Egyptian gourd, which is going to be more entangling than the chait melon or the Egyptian bean, then you know it should be also permitted as well. And that's going to be ultimately why Rebbe is going to retract the view. So. The Gemara is going to is get, in, get into this permit of the Egyptian gourd, which is not stated, uh, stated explicitly. So now, you know, we're talking about the Egyptian gourd. Where is this coming from? And the Gemara refutes Rabbi Hanina's explanation by attacking the assumption. Rabbi uh, Bamari says that, but Rabbi Mana did not say this. In other words, that Rabbi Rebbe's failure to mention the Egyptian gourd implies the exclusion from this prohibition. And Rabbi Mana said that Rebbe said, regarding all these rulings that teach the law of the chait melon Egyptian bean, that the Egyptian gourd is also included. In other words, even if left unstated. So basically, Rebbe's ruling that the chait melon, the Egyptian bean, and also the Egyptian gourd uh, may not lean over the other species, uh, and he's intending that to include for the Egyptian gourd as well. So the Gemara is going to uh, seek another reason for Rebbe's retraction. And it says, rather, says this Gemara, what is the reason behind Rebbe's statement of, I favor the words of the sages over my own? 
It is simply that none of these three spread themselves out over other plants like the Greek gourd does. In other words, since none of these are as intrusive as the Greek gourd, they're all permitted. In other words, it's the nature, says Rabbi Kenievsky. The Gemara is basically saying that, you know, the Rebbe's favoring the sage's view simply because he finds it more convincing that, and that neither the chait melon Egyptian bean nor the Egyptian gourd are going to come close to the, to the Greek gourd for the ability to become entangled up with other plants and to spread out across these work areas into other plants. And based on the known characteristics and nature of these plants, Rebbe decided that logic favors the position of the sages. So there's a lot going on here with the Greek gourd, not only with the stem, which can convey tuma, but also with the leaves and also the vines, the tendrils themselves and how they spread out. And then we're going to be starting chapter three. Have a great day.